Our featured speaker today is Cesar Mor Moran Cahusac with Base Landscape Architecture, and he has a master's in environmental management from the Yale School of Forestry. Throughout his career, he has implemented a vast array of conservation projects, including an organic gardening program for school children in Lima, Peru, and a debt for nature swap financed by Finland for the Machu Picchu Historical Sanctuary. He was the editor of the Machu Picchu Field Guides for Birds, Orchids, and Butterflies. As executive director of Amazon Conservation Association, he worked in the financial sustainability program for the world's first conservation concession located in Los Amigos River Basin in lowland Peruvian rainforest. He's also developed conservation concessions with native Andean and Amazonian communities in coordination with One Sky. The Amazon, the Amazon Conservation Association's major success lies in the consolidation of Brazil nut conservation concessions that benefit more than 500 farmers and protect over 400,000 hectares of forests. Cesar was also a restaurateur in Cusco, gaining firsthand experience with local food systems, gastronomy, and the tourist industry. He's currently the executive director of with Honey in the Heart, which is Base Landscape Architecture's nonprofit branch. Um, you have a really fascinating uh, set of experiences, Cesar. So um, today we'll hear from Cesar on his work on pollinator gardens and urban settings. So I'll pass it over to you. Um, I see your slide, fine. Oh, you're muted. Okay, okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, the first thing that you can see in front of you is our pollinator portal. And our the way we see this is we need to reactivate all pollinators to be able to move on with urban ecological connectivity. At the base, at the bottom of the right-hand corner, bottom right-hand corner, you see our two logos, no? With Honey in the Heart and Base Landscape Architecture. We both together were trying to designing pollinator habitats in different venues. And one thing I need to add, um, I am not an insecticide specialist, but we're trying to work around insecticides. Okay, just wait a minute, okay. Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand at some point if we're trying to work with pollinators, what are environmental services? And generally, these are processes of the natural ecosystem that benefit humans. Humans try to put everything in, a, put everything with a price tag. And that is something that's very conflicting in terms of economics, because generally economics does not include externalities. And Pollination is one of them, no? So we can't put a price tag on pollination. But these include water collection, mitigation of the effects of climate change, generation of oxygen, no? Especially is assimilation of pollutants, herbicides and pesticides, protection of biodiversity, soil retention, they function as well as wildlife refuge, and of course, scenic beauty among others, no? What do insects provide? Nutrition, products, they do soil formation, bioremediation, pollination, especially, which is the theme of this talk, seed dispersal, the bio indicators. If you see an insect, they might say, it might tell you that if a habitat is it's healthy or not, pest control. We use their design for bio designs, know that structures, whatnot. Socially and culturally, they do offer services, no, like insect observation, art, education, religion. As E.O. Wilson pointed out, you know, these are the little animals that run our world. Just an image to show you where we are at in terms of biomass. You see that, that first square there with green, with the plants, and the little corner animals. Out of that, you extend and you see where insects are. No arthropods, arthropods, arthropods are huge while humans is a tiny little thing on the on the on the right hand so they're everywhere in the amazonian tropical rainforest animal biomass the highest animal biomass are are ants bee pollination makes three-fourths of food possible no 
Recently, they have evaluated this between 500 and 7, 777 billion dollars per year, and 90% of all flowers are pollinated by insects. Native insects in the United States provide 57 billion dollars. Okay, for example, dung beetles provide 0 0.38 neutral recycling and dispersal and pest control in farms. 4.49 billion of, for, for pest control of native herbivores and 49.96 billion for recreation. So insects are everywhere in all our lives. What's going on? What's happening? Insect apocalypse. No, the insect population is decreasing. According to a global monitoring data, we have for 40, 52 species, there have been a reduction of 45% of the past 40 years. In Germany, there's been a reduction in bio, insect biomass by 75% in 63 protected areas. And what's really troublesome is for, in Puerto Rico, there was a reduction of 60% of insects in Luquillo forest in the last 40 years. And this pattern is happening all over the, all over the, the world, Europe, the Americas, Asia, and Australia. What's causing it? Of course, overuse of pesticides, which killed them directly and killed their food plants, destroyed habitats, no? Light pollution distracts them, confuses them, introduce invasive species, underma undermine the complex ecological webs, climate change is unpredictable, on effects on the distribution, and most importantly, the Entomological Society of America described this as the death by a thousand cuts, which means that we don't know where they're going to hit us. If insects appear, it might happen from anything. Main drivers, habitat loss, urbanization, agricultural intensification, monocultures specifically, pollution, you no know, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, microplastics are also creating bioaccumulation, pathogens, invasive species, climate change, temperature rise, drought, altitudinal migration, changing weather patterns. All these affect insects. Global insects of invertebrate abundance. You can see how over time butterflies have been reducing its population and also other invertebrates. Something that I like to point out, you know, when I was a kid, I remember driving through Peru and through the United States and my dad's car would get full of insects. Now, as we drive through anywhere, we barely might get a couple of them, which is for me troublesome. It's like, what's going on? Oh, there's something happening and it's tangible. Well, we should be looking at ginormous amount of diversity, colors, forms, ways of living and whatnot, no? This is the most terrible thing that can happen to you. This is a pear farm in China. China has done ginormous amounts of pesticides all over the country. And now some pear farms have to pollinate by hand. Imagine what that means in terms of cost, of effort and time to be able to have some produce, which is, of course, this might mean dedication and patience and whatnot, but this is terrible. Pollination by hand, reduced production, no? High, higher labor cost. It might be the norm in a few years, no? Pollination is an invisible environmental service. I considered it as a cornerstone environmental service, no? Because it is crucial for biological diversity and life, no? Insects and, and plants have co-evolved for this process, no? And we only assure we, we can only assure this if there's a abundance and diversity of pollinators. As I said before, pollination is the cornerstone for protection of ecosystem services. Here are some migration routes that go through monocultures, no, like across the almond fields, no, monarch migration, humming mi migration, bat migration go through gigantic monoculture fields, which if you as a human, it would be if we would only eat potatoes for days or lentils, just lentils, 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 lentils. 
what do you think that how would that impact on your system no would you survive would you stress out what would happen to you would we would we would you be efficient this is just almond fields forever and ever no if you're a bee traversing this it's a nightmare let's talk a little bit of what's going on with pesticides bee toxic pesticides especially neonics, no? These are the ones that we use in soil injections, granular liquid treatments, folder sprays, seed treatment, etc. But what happens is these get attached into this into the plant. They're systemic. And as bees go forage and pick up pollen or nectar, they get affected by it and then they move this to the hive and also affect the hive. Just estimated agricultural use of glyphosate in 2012 and the amount of pesticides used in crops over the years. The extent of neonicotinoid, sorry, use in ag agriculture, you can see that even though 52% of growers have tried to reduce it, we still have a certain huge amount of it in the field. Most importantly, for us, as landscape architects, we see that this is going by itself. <laughs> it's the, that uh, that agricultural crops have less neonics than, oops, it's going by itself. Than or or it's the, than nursery plants. Urban pesticides. You can see it compared with the different non-agricultural and agricultural. No. And this is an extent of how we have had a 48% increase since 1992 to 2014 in oral toxicity. So in terms, synthetic insecticides applied to agricultural lands have fundamentally shifted over time. We're moving from now to a, an arena dominated by neo, neo, neonics and pyrethroids. Neonics are applied at US agricultural lands a lower rate per rate, but now these are extremely more toxic to insects. And unfortunately, in 2020, the Trump administration issued determinations that allows continued neonic use in the country, and this has not changed so far. How do they kill bills? B, sorry, they're highly toxic in small quantities, 48 times more toxic. They're used in, in seed coating. They're water soluble, so they're absorbed by plants and vascular system. It takes time to break down and accumulate in the soil so it builds up over time bees and birds can be poisoned by drinking the moisture exuded from these plants and pesticides affect their nervous system so these are just slides that show what i was talking about no when sweet life goes sour what happens to the bees in terms of how neonics affect them and just an image of how neonics spread all over the plants and distribute over the insects. And you can see on the left, the amount of honey production has been reduced over time. And on the right, a uh, poster that we developed in our education platform to spread the news about how to protect bees and how to move ahead so we can protect them, no? So the way I see it, this is the polar bear, bear on an on an on ice, no, but in this case it's an insect on a on a leaf. And as insects conquer the world, their fate will determine our future. So this is the pollinator boulevard. This is an experiment that base landscape and with honey in the heart tried to do. And it was on the first two medians of market and Dolores, that intersection in front of Whole Foods. The history of this was it was a 1.96 mile span of El Camino Real. No, it was that part of the of the heritage highway that used to cross San Francisco. Its construction happened in 1906 after the the fire and the that this an earthquake that destroyed the mission neighborhood. So these people had encampments there. No, and they eventually they designed these medians for the Wolf Fair in 1910, 1920. And nine, nine decades later, after 
two, after nine, after years of drought, the boulevard, the boulevard was widened, withered with brown patches. Now you can see that and turf of invasive plants. So this is some image, some historical images of that site. And this is what with Honey in the Heart and Base Landscape found. No dry turf and historic palm trees. The team, this is important to mention, had base landscape architecture and with Honey in the Heart and Community Challenge Grant Program from San Francisco Parks Alliance, the, the, public, pub, the Department of Public Works, San Francisco Parks Alliance, Street Parks Program, the Mission Dolores Neighborhood Association, the Whole Foods Market on Market Street, and the Prado Group, that's the building that's right beside the medians. And it was completed in 2016. So next year, it will be our 10 year anniversary. The idea was to develop an urban resiliency project that creates healthy and diverse ecosystems, cultivates community, revives civic values, and one of San Francisco's landmark streets. No, the idea is that we want to become a landmark in the city for pollinator gardens. No, next year, it's our 10th year anniversary. Awards, Golden Gate Award in 2016, Atlas Student Award in 2018, and the Merit Award for Community Project in 2021. Objectives, beautify the city, create biodiversity, works as a verse to help reconnect and restore larger habitats, to move species, move and repopulate different areas, create habitat for pollinators, revitalize civic and historic value neighborhoods, create a resilient drought tolerant planting, brown turf and vicious weeds need to be replaced with smart pollinator plantings, serve the community, community building stewardship. Now this is very complicated because as we speak, the Dolores Pollinator Boulevard on Dolores Boulevard is a conflicting issue between something that's new and the past. The past is just this historical alley with turf and palm trees. And some people consider that extremely sacred. Our vision is to try to develop all of the Dolores Boulevard and make it, transform it into a pollinator garden. No, for the time being, we only have two medians, 316 feet, no, approximately one fourth of a hectare. No, this is where I live and this is the area that can you see my mouse yes no yes we can see it yeah. okay so this is the area the impact area no next another image of the impact area which we this, this is the pollinator garden and this is the area as we were working this process on one of the work days we saw this woman came up came to us and said thank you very much because as I showed you in our previous slides, with the, these Chinese people pollinating by hand, by hand, she had to pollinate by hand her tomatoes. And after two years of establishment, she did not have to do that. Her, to, her, to, her tomatoes were pollinated by pollinators, by bees. So she was happy about that, excited, no, extremely excited that that was happening. And this is just an example of how Putting in a, a small fraction, a small spot in the in in the landscape could improve pollination diversity and connectivity. Just a little about, talk about ecological corridors and patches and stepping stones and links. You can see how little by little we can create stepping stones approach to create a more connected environment to enhance ecol ecology and sustainability. This was the planting after the first year, you can see the difference, no? From bare ground, grass, brown turf to this. This is the landscape. You can see Safeway here and Whole Foods and the landscape as a tunnel, no? This is a valley and a, a, very, a very challenging place for the Pollinator Boulevard because this creates a, a a wind tunnel that affects the plants, their shade and whatnot. So every pollinator garden will have its 
difficulties and its challenges. There's another image on the back and you can see the Polar Boulevard, the two medians, and on top of the building, a butterfly garden. These are two different strategies. One is talking about high maintenance, and the other one is talking about management. Management requires less cost. Continuous management, yes, while maintenance means to keep the same habitat over time. Management might mean that the habitat will change due to the conditions that exist, but we need to work through those to understand how to manage the plants and the watering and whatnot to be able to have a vital ecosystem there. Can I Just, type in with a quick question that's in the yes. chat, Cesar, um, yeah, that's related on. to that? We have a question on who waters and maintains the space now. Oh, that's interesting. Great question, because beforehand, before the pandemic, we had a volunteer group that would go out. When the pandemic hit, nobody came out. So I had to water for two years by myself these two medians for four hours or six hours a week just to make sure the plants survive. So, and why? Because the, the city has dis disconnected the irrigation system. So we had to water by hand, connecting a hose from the Prado Group building to water both medians. So that was challenging, but now the two medians are established. There was a huge change in the planting design, but I can explain that later. But what's important to, to show here is that you can see high maintenance, and management, but at the same time, they are creating connectivity, no stepping stone through the neighborhoods for pollinators and different insects and bees and whatnot. Just an image of how we started the process. You can see a, a table at Whole Foods presenting the idea, people designing, etc., little signs, whatnot, promoting the idea, and eventually developing some sort of promotional idea of how what could be what could we do at this at this median okay so we can have a pollinator garden pollinator habitat a pathway seating whatnot this is just all landscape architecture features but we had to ask the community what they wanted at that time it was we just want plants and that's it because they didn't want homeless to take over those two medians, which is an interesting question, an interesting point of view. This was the design, the first design. We learned later that this does not work, but you, well, since this is in the mission and right beside the Castro, the planted wanted to show a rainbow flag, no? With plants that would bloom over the years, presenting, over the season, sorry, presenting food for the bees and pollinators over the seasons and also showing these different types of blooms. But of course, we learned that this does not work because we need massing structures so pollinators can identify their, their forage to sources over time. This was the planting plan. You can see the different blooms over the year. And you can see that some of the plants that bloom are purple because that's what bees see. They see UV light and that's what attracts them just our, our palais of different plants that were used at that time. The process, no, we had to co cover the ground with mulch and cardboard and wait six months for that, for that soil to degrade and become compost. Then we had the planting. And if you have any questions, just please interrupt me or tell me. More images of the first planting. And what, do, what are we trying to do, no? Let me just move this. Okay, so sustainable planting design is a planting that will thrive. Biodiversity provides good habitat, keeps going on without much input of energy and materials. And this is very important because we need, again, we need to prioritize management instead of maintenance. Maintenance is high cost while management is low labor and it 
and even though you might have skilled labor and maintenance, we need management because that is what's more resilient. No, so we again management over maintenance. And it's not. Am I here? There you go. I don't know what happened. Sorry. Uh, my computer is freezing. OK, so after a couple of years, we found that the two medians increased in 49% flies, 45% bees, more butterflies, and more wasps. And their plants were 42 plant types, 18 of 18 families, and nine native species. This was the transformation from the first planting design to three years afterwards. Okay, so this is pre-pandemic. And this is what we found, no? a new network of resilience. No, you have better soil health. Instead of turf, we have more pollinators, urban garden health, ground shading, we mitigate urban heating. There were better, more ground inf infiltration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the difference between the two different settings. A result of the first bio state, the first insect count, you can see that the first two medians have much more insects than the third median, mostly also native species, which is gigantic in terms of urban settings. The soil was improved by far in the first and second seed in the set between the first and the third median. We provided good habitat. And after years, this is what you find. No, this is the spring. This is what you see. Some images of the pollinator garden. You can see that the agave brings in more aphids, whatnot. This is something that I I generally walk the medians, and this is the palm tree fruits. And over here, you can see there's rat shit, rodents, and they consume that and they live under the under the agaves. So this is interesting. I'm just trying to see the dynamics of what happens in the pollinator garden. Something that for me was really, really important and surprising was to see that homeless people use the medians to charge their cell phones in the pandemic. So for me was, wow, what a, what a use. No, so this creates resiliency. This creates a survivability and also an opportunity for people to use the medium in something that I was totally blown away. So some thoughts that we thought that we could use, maybe increase the middle areas, make it higher, make them higher, so create a border effect, offer more structural resilience with agaves, aloes, and yuccas, I'll explain later. Some areas of the median borders were high enough to capture trash, so that created an image of dirtiness but at the same time, it also helped the, the trash get captured and not just disperse all over the place. We need to measure composition and structures to understand which plant survived. And now again, this is important to say because we had water, then we didn't have water, then we have a pandemic, and we are learning what happened to this, these two medians and what plants survived what is the better design and whatnot. So these are all lessons learned, no? Our communication network was weak in the pandemic. So in a sense, we, we need to understand how to improve that. We did a lot of work right now to try to reactivate the site. So we are doing lots of more work days. I'll explain that later. And um, we need to understand what type of weed management and say, say self-sustaining Pollen or work in the garden we need to do. And furthermore, we understand what type of edge work we need to do in the median. These are all questions related to my thesis and my research. Um, over here, you see just images of the pollinator garden, structure, massing. You no, know, you see it thriving. You see a lot of biomass, pollinator challenges. Again, as I mentioned, you no, know, we have a, uh, a wind canyon there. The palm trees, historical palm trees, limit the sunlight, varies humidity along the medians. Again, we have trouble with the city, with irrigation. So sometimes we have to water by plant, water by hand. And that limits the amount of work that we can do with communities. 
For example, we have a children's school on the on um, between 16th, 17th, and between 18th and 19th, and they want to have a, a pollinator boulevard, a garden there, but there's no water. And I cannot work with a, a children's school if they have to water by hand, which would be critical, no? Hazardous. Again, we understand what how people use the medians, no? They trample them, no? Homeless do use the medians, they sleep there. I've seen needles there. They store their belongings, they leave carts, whatnot, but they also, I also seen homeless tending the garden, picking up trash, weeding, and I walk up to them and say, hey, what are you doing here? No, I know this, I feel that this is an important site. I need to work it. It's totally different than the other two medians. So I wanna help. So at the same time, there's conflicting issues. No, homeless do take advantage of the site while some people might criticize their, their presence there, no? Trash is also important issue because of Whole Foods and Safeway. We did have limited maintenance during the COVID pandemic, so that transformed the landscape, no? After people used the medians in the pandemic to walk their dogs and dogs would trample everything, again, it's, it's a use. We need to develop and design so that gets improved, more resilience. During the pandemic, neighbors did dump construction waste on the medians. People have burned, stolen, and hacked plants. Cars have crashed into the median, no? And again, uh, there's conflicting views of, of these two medians, no? While the Historical Society San Francisco looks at it as a, as a, her, as a heretics, no? How can you do this? You're, you're, you're competing with a statue that's killing somebody on a horse while we had, and we had a, a sign there that, that, that explained what the pollinator garden was doing and what it was it about. And they asked us to retrieve the sign because it was distracting from the statue. It was, it was conflicting. So again, views need to change. Just an image of this massing and how the, we, we have a wind tunnel there. Images of what we can see, no? Trash, this person had the sofa inside the median and now he's using it for sleep. So he moved it to the side because the sun was there. Interesting, I didn't tell him not to do anything. I just observed and say, okay, cool. You're using the site for relaxing and taking it easy. This is just about desire lanes, no? Landscape architectures suffer with this. What does that mean in terms of use? how people are gonna traverse the landscape, trampling, whatnot, and also structural resilience created by agaves and yuccas. They, some way or the other, direct the people through the landscape. This is another interesting site. This is on top, you see the pollinator garden, and then you see pandemic times, homeless using the medians, the policemen taking care of them, like keeping an eye on them. And uh, you can see that the areas that did not have pollinator gardens were taken over and the ones that didn't have, did have pollinator gardens were not. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just seeing what I see, know what I saw and I'm recording it. Another thing you can see how the sage was burnt and then it came back. So we need resilient plants that will survive these types of attacks. This is me watering during the pandemic. Again, conflicting issues. You know, we have a sign and a statue that's trampling over somebody, you know, a horse is trampling over somebody. What are we trying to, what are we, you know, are we, what type of society are we trying to develop? You no, know, a more resilient one, sustainable one, more empathic. Hey folks, I think uh, Cesar's internet froze. Let's give it a second. As I was saying, you know, what type of plants? You no, know, so it should be native species, adapted species to the habitat, general species. Now this is important because sometimes we say we are against invasives, you no, know, or we're against plants that could be adapted to a site. But again, Think about urban ecology and 
what urban means. Generally, urban sites drain environmental services from their surrounding nature. And what we have to do in terms of climate change and adaptation and become resilient, we need to create our own environmental services. So generalists do help in that process. No? They need to be drought tolerant. Of course, non-systemic pesticides are a must. They have to be fire resistant in areas that are fire prone, be resilient. And what we've learned, they also have to offer structural resilience. Remember those agaves that, that you saw in the images? Those agaves prevent trampling and also direct movement along the landscape, not along, that, along those two medians in that case. Um, installation and planting, well, for a pollinator garden, we need to consider first that blooms should coincide you know, with pollinator emergence and activity, which means that pollinators will be able to forage and feed while they traverse the landscape. You no, know? ensure you have blooms all year for that. Cluster or massing of the same plant species together because this facilitates identification and foraging. Allow spaces in the soil for nesting habitats. In the pollinator, we have found two bumblebee nests, which is gigantic in an urban setting. And also, we could consider dead snags, but and some leaves. Dangerous, what not? No, so again, design based. Now we understand what we're trying to develop in, on a site. Um, and again, habitat restoration and enrichment versus management, no? What are we trying to do? Depends on the site, depends on the history of the site, depends on the sociology of the site, depends on the challenges of, of the site. But we do have to do weed control, no? Understand the habitat diversity and trying to know what was there and what will be there. Um, we might do enrichment planting, no? Throw seed balls, native, native wildflowers, etc. Now, these are the images I wanted to show is how these two medians are being used, no? Definitely work days by Whole Food employees and, and neighbors. They work on the site, no? We have done educational work days with children from different schools. People do walk their dogs on median two in the second one because there's less vegeta vegetation, they hang around. People sit beside Whole Foods and look at the medians. There's celebrations and gatherings on the medians. People use the medians as a shortcut to access Whole Foods. People do charge their phones, put things away there. People just sit and observe, etc. No, and then I had a series of images of different <laughs> plants and challenges, and 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 I did an evaluation after the pandemic of what how it had moved from the first planting to the second planting, what was the morphing, what was the transformation, what plant survived. And that was the analysis that I would show in the pictures that, that you can't see, unfortunately. No. Showing some of the plants, what not. This created a pollinator garden, which I'm showing, but you can't see. Um, we developed two posters, which are on our website. And I had a a slide that talks about the new urban garden or the pollinator garden, no? which is a landscape that looks into beauty with functional aesthetics in, in order to improve habitability, life quality, as a way to achieve social and environmental resilience. No? Of course, via this novel ecosystem, this, no, the pollinator garden, which we try to do. And there's, a, there's an image of different squares that say improve habitability and well-being, well-being move towards strengthened mind, body, spirit, mental and physical health. You know, it creates an innovative urban food system, which in, enables improved urban connectivity, biodiversity flows, environmental interactions, and environmental services are ensured. Again, the idea is to create environmental services in the urban setting. No? which will bring in positive impacts from people's health, improves, there's studies that improve household finances, green areas, no? 
They trap dust, car dust. People will get better faster when they're surrounded by green areas. Greenery reduces crime by 25%. It creates social capital, no? It has a mental restorative effect. I have interviewed people and they see the site and say they relax there, they feel better. Value of the homes increase. Definitely curbs climate change effects. No, and create, we are creating direct and indirect connections with nature and the outdoors. This is what I was talking about of creating ecosystem environmental service in the urban area. Beautifies the city, makes it more livable. Increases in urban environmental services, as, you, as, a, as I mentioned. No, it secures pollination and energy flows. Allows for a connected resilient landscape. And furthermore, it's a way to move towards the global eco health, one health systems. Know that it's in trend now. The idea is to develop, as with base landscape, we're trying to develop a pollinator garden toolbox that we can implement in malls, parking lots, schools, churches, wasteland, bus stops, median, urban edges, road verges, bicycle paths, green roofs rain gardens, cemeteries, soil gardens, etc. That's what we're working on right now. What type of design, planting, strategies, working with the community can enable these type of esteemed habitats. As landscape architects, what do we need to do? We need to rewrite the specs. Of course, no chemical use, source the plants free from pesticides. Uh, understand how to work with agencies, city agencies, so we can use roads, power lines, railroads, easements, other type of infrastructure, educate people, et cetera, understand what we're trying to do, present what we're trying to do, and of course, appreciate our insects, no, for sure. And also, this offers an opportunity for the urban science, so people can use platforms to indicate and tell everybody what they have seen in these pollinator gardens as the new neighbors, the new users. As landscape architects and environmentalists, we need to design and plan for all the users, not just human beings. That means water, wind, and all living insects, animals, and creatures. We need to understand how to design for everybody, every single user. Um, we need to become pollinators. We need to create interest. We need to awaken. We need to advocate. We need to create awareness. We need to educate. We need to be extremely creative. We need to take the opportunities. We need to take action. We need to track our work. And finally, we need to pollinate. And I had a great image of different bees and stuff that you can see. So you can say, hey, that's cool. You can't see it now. <laughs> And I had an image of two bees holding with a net planet Earth. That was a mural. And I see that as the bees hold the planet in place. No, it's extremely important for that. And just a short message. No, you have to shine an illuminating kind resilience into the world. That's our work. That's what we try to do. We need to become more empathic, more compassionate. So, so our design becomes more resilient. And that's it.